Hello and welcome to the second uh, episode of our double feature this week with Mark Hackle, of course, back for the third time. He ties Darren Harris now for the most appearances on our show three times. Mark, it's great to see you again. Great to have you on again. Yeah, thanks, guys. I feel like Steph Curry. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mark, uh, before we real quick before we get started, um, me and Brian were both fortunate enough to graduate uh, last year and have a full graduation ceremony. Uh, but the class of 2020 this year, unfortunately, does not. Uh, do you have any words for a good makeup of our audience, the Frazier class of 2020? Oh, shout out. You know what? Uh, interesting. I, I, I follow wrestling. That's my biggest thing. And uh, I've been watching those kids. They were the ones that kind of made it under the wire. They were able to get the state championships through just before they decided to shut down all the school uh, programs and everything else. So, uh, you know, fortunately being there watching that, uh, you know, play out over Ford Field. Uh, boy, I tell you, I don't I don't know what it would have been like. I, I went to state finals back when I graduated high school in uh, wrestling. And uh, being there watching it and all of a sudden watching it shut out, it made me stop and think, man, what if they weren't able to do that? And unfortunately, that's what happened with a lot of other programs. You know, uh, some of the other things, the kids that were doing at the time, they couldn't finish up on it. And now looking at their high school graduation, you know, you, you got to experience it, walking across the stage, having some of the parties, you know, the engagement with some of your classmates. It was kind of exciting. I mean, that culmination was something you look forward to. And uh, when it was happening, you were excited. And then when you get away from high school, you're going, man, I'm, now even more so than ever, you're like, I'm glad I got to experience that, but I feel sorry for the kids that did not. You know, what, what, a, what a sad reality. Yeah, it's just unfortunate. Um, you know, it's they still get to, you know, the class of 2020 got, you know, the cap and gowns, but not in the traditional way that we got them. Uh, it's just unfortunate, but they do get to graduate. And Frazier's just, Frazier's in doing it in a, a, a unique way of graduating, so that will be interesting to see how they do it. So... Well, some of it. I saw some of the news clips. They actually were, uh, you know, having like a, a drive through uh, in the parking lot there. I saw some of the kids on the field. You know, they were trying to do with a social distancing, masks. They had the caps and gowns. Kind of yeah. neat. Got an east at Anchor Bay. They're doing something very modest, you know, by the big, uh, if you will, anchor that they have. They can yep. take class. They're, they're driving in their subdivisions by their homes. So each one is doing something different, you know, and again, yeah, they're just going to have to experience it in that fashion, one that will never be forgotten. I mean, I hopefully we don't have that again, uh, but uh, yeah. who knows? Who Def definitely. So now yesterday uh, in the news, the governor lifted restrictions on retail opening with restrictions, uh, allowed along with doctor and dental appointments and gatherings up to 10 people are now allowed. But she's considering extending the stay-at-home order as a college student I do not understand this, and what is like what is the reasoning behind this? Aaron, you're asking a great question, and that's been my uh, my challenge. I think we got it. I think everybody understood, whether it was the general public, uh, public officials, and or businesses, uh, we understood what the whole idea or the premise early on was: to flatten the curve, getting everybody involved, wearing the mask, social distancing, stay at home, and we did that. I think everybody supported that. Uh, but now the question is, okay, what is the rationale behind the decision-making process right now for continuing this and uh, for opening some versus not opening others, uh, meaning businesses and or even the schools, or what's the expectation? And there isn't a lot of direction on that, uh, to be quite honest with you. I've challenged it, and unfortunately, we have run into some you know, uh, challenges with asking that very same question. What is the basis of making these decisions? As a law enforcement official in my background, we would like to ask a lot of questions. And one of those questions is why, you know, and what, what's the reasoning behind this? And we're not getting a lot of answers, and that's very unfortunate. Um, and, you know, I guess pitting people against one another now uh, as to, you know, getting uh, some information, uh, I, I, don't, I don't have your answer. And that's mm -hmm. unfortunate for me. As a public official, when I have to say to you, I don't know, ask the governor. I don't know. Look at the, her orders. Uh, that's not appropriate. I should be able to answer that question you just asked uh, in a relatively uh, – sensible way and i can't do that yeah because it's definitely uh it seems contradicting because she's thinking about extending the stay-at-home order but you can have up to 10 people gather uh it's it's you know and retail and everything else is starting to open up at limited capacity and it's real it's confusing to hear on, on especially being being so you know being in college or being in high school or even younger than that it's confusing to hear and um and try, and you said and you said um, not not having the answer and it's and it's frust it's frustrating for everybody. You know, guys, think about it. There's extremes. You got people that aren't really concerned or worried about it, and you got people that are very worried and very concerned. 
And, uh, you know, we are concerned for people that have health issues. We are concerned for people that are elderly and uh, nothing changes for them. They should stay home, stay sheltered, stay, you know, away from other people and everything. But you got the people on this extreme who are saying, listen, I'm OK with it. I'm not afraid. I can venture out. Let me, uh, you know, take things at my own risk. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm willing to accept, you know, wearing a mask if I have to. I'm willing to keep six feet apart. But to say that everything has to continue to shut down when we know those numbers are drastically reduced, uh, I don't understand that. And so for some that want to take the moral high ground and saying we got to continue to do this because we don't want a second wave, we got to continue to do this because there's still cases out there, we got to continue to do this because there's still deaths out there. Well, I got to say, we've opened up certain aspects of the economy, even though there are certain people that are still going to get exposed to this and people that were died. So we've, ex we've, we've decided to open up certain aspects of the economy. The question is why? Why were we you know, taking that risk? Why are we taking that challenge or that chance knowing that these risks are still here? And the answer isn't clear. We're not understanding why. So I agree we should be opening up the economy. I agree we should allow certain things to take place with precautions in place. And if people want to venture out, they can. They don't have to. If somebody wants to still stay at home because they're afraid or wear a mask because they're concerned, they still should be allowed to do that. But we're opening it up with certain aspects of the economy. And if it means opening up school, if it means allowing sports to continue, I think we need to do that and allow people the ability to make their own decisions based upon their own comfort levels. And, uh, you know, uh, when we're going to get to that or why or how, uh, that's the uh, that's the missing question right now. Or answer, I should say. That's the question we're missing. Okay. Yeah. So uh, you were talking about what you and the gov what, what the governor is doing for the state so far, but let's talk more specifically about you and your team because for the past couple of months, obviously, you guys have had your hands filled with the county of Macomb and even with the entire state. So with that being said, Mark, I have to ask just out of the gate: Do you think we are progressing enough, like county or statewide, that we're going to have a summer without restrictions or possibly less restrictions? Like, what's your opinion on that? Well, the simplest way of putting it is, uh, as the executive, I have no executive orders put in place closing anything down. Never have. All we have done is follow CDC guidelines internally as an organization uh, to try to keep our folks safe. The county government has always been open, and uh, we have an emergency order in place, a state of emergency for the county, which gives me the latitude of working with all the municipalities that make up Macomb County, working with our continuing work with our workforce, and receive funding from the federal government to support some of the issues dealing with the businesses, making sure people get PPEs and food programs for people that are in need of food programs. So having that state of emergency gives me the ability to be that conduit and support things that are going on. But we have not tried to control or dictate anything that goes on with the private sector, uh, schools or educational component. So uh, with that being said, everything we're doing is in, I guess, response to what's coming down from the state of Michigan, from the governor's office. And with that, we have to scramble each and every time there's a new executive order to get some uh, understanding to the public. And so when people are asking us, what does it mean and what does this requirement uh, you know, restrict us to, uh, we're trying to give them the best answers we can. But I keep reminding everybody, these are the governor's executive orders. These aren't, these aren't county, you know, Macomb's executive orders. We don't have any of those in place. And so whatever restrictions are imposed and or lifted, uh, we have to kind of coincide with that, but try to give understanding to the public. And we try and do the best we can. Uh, but for the most part, uh, we're fortunate here with our team. We've been working extremely close with our ISD, that's Macomb Intermediate School District, and the 27 uh, municipalities, as well as their school districts, and uh, even Macomb Community College. And so with that, we're trying to get things back up and running. We're trying to get it open and trying to get an understanding to the governor that people are taking precautions seriously. Uh, but people also want to venture out and want to see the economy get going, and we all care about health and safety. Uh, I don't think anybody owns that moral high ground to say, you know, they're more concerned about health and safety than <laughs> health. We are all concerned about that. And so with that being said, since day one, our very first case here in Macomb County was March 13th. Uh, but prior to that, we recognized this issue hit, hit Michigan and hit, this, hit our country back in March. I think it was March 23rd in uh, Washington State. Uh, I'm sorry, January uh, was when that actually hit. And so with that being said, we we got on we got our team together to start realizing what can we do for Macomb County residents and uh, try to keep things going to the extent that we could until executive orders came in place from the state. That's a very yeah, that's a very good point. So uh, from what you and your team still understand right now, the, in terms of the fear of the second wave coming for us, uh, will it become a new normal for people at work and school to like wear a mask all the time whenever they are in these kind of environments? 
Yeah, that's a good question. I think right now uh, most people are looking at that as uh, more than likely that's going to be the, the going to be the issue moving forward. Um, if you stop and think about it, we're weighing two crises right now: uh, the health crisis as well as an economic crisis. Yeah. And so with that, I think our team, and you keep referring to team, I look at team as being not just internally what we have here with the county, but uh, every citizen within Macomb County, 877,000 people, our school districts, our, our municipal partners, 27 dis distinct uh, communities within Macomb County, um, our educational partners. So everybody's part of this team, and we're hearing from a lot of folks. The only big concern we're having is, is the, the difference of people's fears, the fear levels about this particular pandemic. And there are people that are on screen saying, we need to lock down, we need to shut down, we can't have everybody in place, we can't have everybody out and about. That's just not practical because of the economic crisis we're facing as well. But when we start moving forward, we always have this ability to tell people that are on this part of the screen, you could still stay home. You don't need to venture out. And uh, you know there there is an opportunity for you there, but knowing that the, the numbers are extremely low now, as far as cases, uh, people are worried about the second wave. Well, if that second wave comes, we're prepared to handle it better than we were the first time this happened yeah. with our uh, with our, our our first responders, with our healthcare environment. Everybody's prepared to, have to handle a second wave when it comes, and we have the ability to pull back if we start to see it become somewhat of a, a, a concern. So, again. Um, we're working with the community, we're working with everyone to try to figure out how do we deal with sensibly, but I think it's time to start opening more aspects of the economy uh, because people are prepared to be part of the solution. Right, like, because, you know, what, you know, it kind of like, kind of leads me in my next point. You said about looking at the numbers and looking at the recent numbers you probably just, you know, you've, you, you've been looking at, uh, just in Macomb County, have the total number of cases and death, deaths gone down like dramatically in the past, in the month of May? Yeah, actually, it's an interesting question, Eric. Uh, it started in April. April 1st, we started seeing the drastic reduction in decline. So over the past month, uh, it has been significantly lower to the point where we only had one death on reported on one day, uh, which was, you know, significantly less. Obviously, we'd like to see no deaths, but that's just not practical. I mean, there are people dying of other ailments and other, you know, issues. Right. In society. So... I mean, does that mean, you know, we have to wait till there's no more cases, no more deaths before we start opening the economy? I don't think uh, anybody believes that to be the case. I think we're all starting to realize that. But the new normal moving forward is going to be you're going to have people probably from this point forward always wearing a mask. You're going to have people from this point forward always trying to keep six feet apart or trying to make sure that people are, you know, washing their hands. And yet there are going to be people out there saying the day that we can open the economy and no more stay-at-home orders, I'm not wearing a mask. I'm not going to wash my hands. I'm going to get close. I'm going to give somebody a bro hug. You know, we're going to, we're going to start seeing some of that, you know, that contact coming back. And I'm a, I'm one of those people that uh, is very engaging, you know, and I like to shake a hand, you know, I'll give somebody a hug. And uh, it's, 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 it's driving me crazy not being able to do that. So with that being said, I think, uh, you know, there's going to be a difference moving forward of how people perceive this and how they're going to act, you know, for years to come. Right. So do you do you feel that certain businesses should have opened sooner already that that, you know, that we should have and, and that we should be farther ahead in this progress of reopening the economy? I do. I, I do believe that uh, we should have allowed some of them to open. And here's the reason why. I think our business partners want to be part of the solution and they're going to take the crossing CDC guidelines and or executive orders. They're going to put those in play to try to protect themselves, meaning uh, their employees, as well as the general public. They're not out there trying to figure out how do we you know, try to harm somebody. They're going to be part of the solution. And it provides an opportunity for those that still don't want to go. They don't have to go. So if a health club or a gym opens up or a restaurant decides to open up or somebody who wants to cut hair, you know, a hair salon wants to open up, if you don't feel comfortable going, don't go. If you, you still have that fear factor of, you know, uh, still I might get this or it might be contagious or something, uh, or I don't trust that facility to be cleanly enough, then don't go. I mean, if you're you're elderly, you're, you've got health issues, I, I would recommend those people still stay home, shelter in place. But people like myself who want to go to the health club, somebody who does want to go get a haircut, um, if I want to venture out and I trust the, the people that cut my hair to do the right things, um, I'm going to go there. And if I want to go lift some weights at the gym, I'm going to go there uh, because I trust, you know, that they're going to keep it safe for themselves as well as others. So, yeah, I believe they should have opened up more of the economy. Um, you know, the question is, 
Why haven't they opened up these folks, but yet we're opening up manufacturing, yet we're opening up, you know, uh, the golf courses and other sectors, uh, you know, let, let right. them be part of the solution. And I think they're willing to do that. All right, because I'm definitely with you. Uh, I definitely need a haircut because it's been a long time. Uh, and I would love to... Guys are, you silent. You remind, remind me of when I graduated from high school. You kind of got that 70s, 80s look <laughs> long hair. <laughs> yeah, to add on uh, what you were saying, Mark, because I've heard some backlash in the news with tying in with sports that Ben Roethlisberger went to get a haircut, and they were giving him some backlash on the news about him doing that. So it's just, yeah, people are opening up their facilities, opening up their, uh, you know, businesses, ventures whatsoever. Like, like you said, if people trust their business, they can have the right to go. But if not, like you said, just stay home. Like, just keep following all the orders like everyone else has been doing. So, yeah, no matter what, I feel like there's going to be backlash with whatever choice is made. Absolutely. Yeah, and, who, and who are we kidding? I mean, stop and think about it. Back prohibition, they said people can't drink no more. Drinking uh, alcohol is gone. What did they do? It created an underground that people yep. were doing ways, you know. Exactly pigs and all that and then uh you know drugs i mean i look at law enforcement from that experience you know when you know if, if marijuana is uh, not legal or or whatever other drug of choice might be out there there's going to be a black market for them people are going to find a way well geez are you kidding me now we're almost liking it to people getting a haircut where you got to have people that are barbers and hair salon people that are, are trying to figure out how they quietly go to somebody's home and cut their hair because it's happening i mean this mm -hmm. is what's going on and they're doing somewhat feeling guilty about it I think it's the most, it's it's kind of crazy, you know, and now that somebody does go get a haircut, they're being chastised uh, for it, or the guy up in Owasso who's cutting hair still, and he's 77 years old, been doing this for life, and he says, listen, I got my mask on, I want to cut somebody's hair, now he's getting ticketed, he's got to go to court for this, what's happened to society, I think it's just absolutely insane, and then to be berated by people for doing oh, yeah. that, it, it's kind of, kind of a sad reality how far we've come with this, and, uh, you know, again, I, I believe there was a need at first, and uh, we did that. We flattened the curve, and that was because we didn't want the onset and the capacity issues uh, to be something that the hospitals couldn't handle. They can handle it now, and they're telling you that. They're saying our, our, eight, our, our ER rooms are open. We're doing non-elective surgeries. Come on in. We can handle the capacity now of issues that are going on, but people, if you're afraid, stay home. But those that want to go get a haircut should be allowed to be able to go get a haircut and feel safe doing it. Or if they want to go to a restaurant, be able to do it or go lift some weights. I, I just really don't understand, you know, somebody wanting to say, well, we can't continue to do this because that, uh, you know, the, the issue is still out there. It's not going away for the next year, two years, or maybe even longer until there's, you know, some type of a, a, a cure that's uh, that's put in place here. Absolutely, 100%. Yeah, that's well said by County Executive Mark Hackle right here, folks. So uh, to tie the overall situation on how Michigan is handling it, respectfully asking, of course, what do you think of the, gover uh, the governor's overall handling of this situation? Well, I, I think she did a good job. I'm just going to be you know, honest. We had to do something early on, and uh, it wasn't an easy decision to say essential versus not essential and shut some, uh, you know, some companies or businesses down, and we had to make that decision. It was a tough call, and so she did the right thing in putting the executive orders in place, but I think since that time, the question is, okay, we did that, and we met the goal, and that was to flatten the curve, or lessen the apex, if you will. Now that we've done that, I mean, everybody got on board and was a part of the solution. We are so far beyond flattening the curve and, uh, you know, lessening the impact on our hospitals. The secondary question is, okay, why can't we start opening these things? And now the controversy is in play. And uh, I would have to disagree with her, uh, not opening more sectors of the economy and giving our business partners the opportunity to be part of the solution. Allow schools to make a decision as to how they want to open aggressively do so. Sports activities, how do we allow them to do it in a safe fashion if they feel like they can accommodate that you know, for the players as, or, as well as the fans? Uh, you gotta allow them the opportunity to, to, to do that now. And uh, I, that's just not happening. The bigger concern is well, what are we basing our decisions on right now is definitely not something that's, uh, uh, that's front and center. And uh, that's the elusive uh, uh, concern or question, I guess, uh, uh, to be answered. So now in, re in, re in recent news, uh, the president of the United States is in the state, has been in the state of Michigan for a couple of months now. Um, and he was at the Ford plants and stuff like that. My question for you, Mark, what is your opinion how a president of the, of the United States is handling the overall crisis? Well, I think there were some mishaps along the way. I mean, let's face it, you know, saying this thing was a hoax at the onset was probably not the best terminology to use. Uh, you know, there was an issue, and it did hit hard. 
And, uh, you know, a lot of uh, areas of the country, you know, were, were besieged by this, you know, New York being number one. So I think there needs to be an earlier reaction to this and trying to get people to realize this is a serious issue, um, you know, uh, as, a, as, a, as opposed to kind of like, you know, softening uh, that at early onset. Uh, I think the antagonistic uh, Democrat versus Republican kind of response is never uh, something good from either side. You know, whether it's uh, the president, you know, going after Democrats as to, you know, uh, being, being kind of added into this pandemic. And then obviously we're seeing it from the Democrats, too. You know, they just want to level everything they can on this pandemic, you know, and say the, uh, the president. So, you know, we try to remove the politics. We've got an issue. There's a crisis. How do we handle it based upon facts, information? Listen to our experts. And uh, when we start progressing through this, let's be open up. Let's not use it as a political tool, especially during an election cycle, but that's not going to happen. Uh, politicians are going to continue to politicize this issue as we move forward, more so because there's an election right around the corner. And so with that being said, you know, there are probably many things he could have done differently and should have done. Uh, but I think more of it is his, uh, his tone and uh, kind of his demeanor uh, was, I think, what was missing uh, during this initial onset of the crisis. Yeah, absolutely. So... Again, going with, you talked about how you're now well prepared for what's coming out in the future, if anything does come. But when the pandemic first started, it seemed like the United States did not have all the supplies such as respirators, masks, gloves, etc. for people to use. Again, respectfully asking, of course, would you think that it's the previous administration's failure or the current administration's failure? Or do you think it's like a mixture of both? I think it's uh, I think it's decades of uh, failure to really be prepared for something like this. So I don't think yeah. it was just this past president, the current president. I think you know the country was not prepared or was ill prepared uh, to have not only availability of equipment necessary for some type of a pandemic, um, you know, a stockpile of it, but also um, having manufacturers readily available to to create this. Uh, interesting enough, if you think about what goes on here in Southeast Michigan, I'll use Macomb County for the example. We were known as the arsenal of democracy in the 40s when we had to figure out, you know, how do we transition from automotive to war efforts and what we needed to do. That happened here. And that happened in southeast Michigan. Where we prepared ourselves for that war, uh, you know, the World War II and uh, that fight. And uh, we won the war based on technology and the transformation uh, into the arsenal of democracy. With that being said, there isn't anything that we can't make here. So that arsenal of innovation from concept to consumer, no one does it better than right here in southeast Michigan. So whatever it is you can think of and uh, the creation of it, putting it together with our engineers and engineering talent to the workforce that actually manufactures it, no one does it better than Southeast Michigan. So arsenal of democracy, arsenal of innovation, and what we just got through experiencing what's happened because of the shortage of masks, gowns, uh, face shields, um, gloves, and uh, even ventilators. We transformed into the arsenal of health. Folks here in Southeast Michigan, our manufacturers, our, our big three, they transform their facilities to try to figure out how do we prepare and make those masks? How do we make the gowns? How do we make the gloves? And what are we doing about face shields and even ventilators? We made that here in Southeast Michigan in a very short period of time to get up and running. That was the number one concern. You, you mentioned that, and it's a great point. We were so far behind. And now we're uh, no longer is that the main request. No longer are we saying, my gosh, we still need PPEs. My gosh, we don't have enough ventilators. You know, we're looking. We have been able to step up and make that a reality and got that going. The big concern right now is how do we deal with this economic crisis uh, that has been created as a result of this health crisis? And the only way to do that right now is get the economy back up and running. And I think that's, I think that's everyone's concern right now. And uh, we're fighting uh, a political battle uh, to try to get that up and running. And politics are getting in the way of making the decision to help us get through this uh, economic crisis right now. I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. The big three definitely stepped up in a way to not only help the state of Michigan, but to help the entire country as a whole. So speak. So speaking of stock, stockpiling supplies, is Macomb County having having to have a stockpile of supplies, or would the county get them from the state of Michigan? And with what just happened with the short supplies, is that something that you as county executive could obtain? Just for the county, like have a warehouse full of supplies for county hospitals, nursing homes, um, just, and, and, or any healthcare, uh, any healthcare practice or facility. 
you know, we, we became command central for distribution locally for our, I was our first responders in our hospitals and uh, those that were you know, essential workers. Uh, we had to figure that out. When we got our emergency order in place, declaration of emergency, we became the conduit for all entities in Macomb County. And so with that, that was the number one concern. How do we obtain those? We're competing with every other entity around the entire country for masks, and they just weren't available. So we were scrapping like everyone else. It was a competitive nature, trying to figure out how do we get them first. Uh, we were able to get companies here in Macomb County to make them. We had people making them in their homes, and uh, manufacturers were saying, you know what, we can readily get these things available. So there were so many different manufacturers that were trying to get us a type of equipment that we could uh, use, uh, but a lot of it wasn't the professional standard N95 masks, uh, the gowns that were necessary. But, boy, I'm going to tell you, uh, when these companies started ramping up, uh, we got inundated with supplies. We had to come up with our own funding at the onset. Uh, you know, about a million and a half, two million to purchase uh, those uh, PPEs. Uh, we got them in place. And yes, to answer your, your question directly, Aaron, well, we do now have a stockpile and we're going to continue to do that. We got some federal funding from CARES funding to really help with that. And uh, we are, are doing just, uh, as you had mentioned, uh, stockpiling this not only for current needs, but for future needs as well. Fortunately, ventilators weren't a big concern for the hospitals here because we flattened that curve. Uh, there wasn't really a need for the GCF facility, the Novi Center for excess capacity. There really wasn't a need for that because we were able to, to I guess, if you will, uh, transition, uh, you know, people into understanding this concern and lessen that uh, that impact. So uh, ventilators weren't a big deal, but gowns, gloves, masks were uh, a hot priority. Absolutely, and uh, I'm. You know, as a citizen, as a citizen of Macomb County, I'm so happy to hear that uh, the county is taking uh, necessary preps to stockpile in case this happens again or any other, who knows, any, God forbid, any other uh, virus or uh, anything that hit, can, could hit our county. So now, Mark, we're going to transition uh, into our one of our favorite segments that we do on the show with all of our guests. It's called Rapid Fire 7, ra seven random questions. Nothing, not, nothing to do with politics, just to just get, go, maybe catch you off, off guard a little bit. So let's just see, how, let's just see how you answer, and Alex can start first. I'm ready. All right. So if a movie was being made of your life, and you could choose any actor to play you, who would it be and why? Oh, God. Jeez. Um, <laughs> probably Mark Harmon. That threw me off. All right. I'm Mark Harmon. The only reason I say this is because he's the only one that kind of, I, I have similar features to that guy. He's a very, he's very calm. He's a little bit older, so he's got a very distinguished look. So I go with Mark Harmon. Hmm. Oh, let's bring him back. That's right. You guys got to look that one. You got to Google that out. You got to figure out who the heck Mark Harmon is, don't you? <laughs> so, oh, yeah, I threw you guys off. So, <laughs> so next for you, Mark, uh, what childish things do you as an adult like to do? Like pranks or jokes or just anything of that nature? Uncle jokes. I do uncle jokes. I'm, I'm great with that. I'm playing off of words. Uh, the kids love it. Well, they don't really, but they pretend like they do. So uncle jokes are my favorite thing. <laughs> what has you? What has been your go-to uh, TV show uh, during this entire crisis and uh, quarantine? Oh, uh, well, it was Tiger King, but uh, the episodes ran out. Mm. So I, I was actually glued to that, but I'm one of those that likes the, uh, uh, the, the Datelines uh um, the Forensic Files. I mean, I, I, I love those uh, uh, those shows. Those are, those are probably my favorites right now. Oh, yeah, I've definitely taken a liking to those two as well. They're unfortunately pretty sad, but they're also just very interesting as well to watch. Sure. So, yeah. So you talked about being on our previous couple shows in the past that your all-time favorite athlete was Dick Buckus. But besides him, who's your second all-time favorite athlete? Uh, Muhammad Ali. Wow. Muhammad Ali. Okay. Yeah. What a legend. Wow. His, uh, his demeanor, his uh, you know, just I, I love that the drawing that he that he does to kind of get that you know whether whether he knew he was going to win a fight or not you couldn't tell because uh, he he was extremely confident in his demeanor. All right, so favorite, so taking take you know going back in time here, favorite sport or game to play at recess as a kid? Uh, probably basketball. Yeah, basketball. I did that even even at lunch hour. You know, when I was in high school. You know, because you're always cutting weight for wrestling to begin with. So I never really went into the lunchroom. So I'd go into the gym and just start uh, shooting basketball, just kind of, you know, pick up games. Uh, worked up a great sweat, went to my next uh, fourth and fifth hour, you know, smelling really good. So uh, <laughs> oh, that's always a fun sport to play. I didn't care. I was a wrestler. I didn't care. <laughs> so, so next for you, we have a sort of would you rather question. So let's get into it. So 
Would you rather wake up and be any animal for a week? And if you did pick that, I'll ask you a follow-up question. Or would you rather speak every language in the world forever? I'd rather I'd rather wake up and be a panther, man. You know, just kind of crawling. Be crawling. a panther? Panther, yeah. Like yeah. panther. So working work in the work in the territories. So, oh, so <laughs> you just answered my follow-up question. So that was perfect. Looking no, for food. Yeah, perfect. You know? <laughs> uh, and finally, Mark, name your top five favorite foods top five well i'm gonna go with uh raisin bran for breakfast i'll go with a uh, pizza um uh, uh third would be pizza and then uh pizza and uh <laughs> actually i'm a tropical smoothie i'll be honest with you I like <laughs> peanut butter and jelly sandwiches peanut butter and jelly pbj's you can't beat those so but it's got to be crunchy peanut butter and raspberry jelly really and, yes i don't like gray jelly i can't do great jelly I'm, see, I'm the opposite. I have to have smooth. I have to have smooth peanut, smooth peanut butter and grape jelly all the way. That's just how I. That's just how I have to go. Uh, uh, so. so that was a great way to end our rapid fire seven questions. So thank you for doing that with us, Mark. So now we're going to transition our questions into the sports aspect for you. So how do you feel about sports being played with no fans or venues limited at capacity? I think they're going to have to do it, but I don't like the idea. I mean, it's like that's what it's all about, man, having the maturing section. All right. All right. So now let's just scrap all the pandemic stuff and uh, just a few sport, quick sports questions before we go. Uh, did you watch The Last Dance? And if so, what, what, are, your, what are your thoughts on that documented series? You know, I've always been impressed with Michael Jordan. I thought he was one of the, he is without question, one of the greatest uh, sports athletes in particular dealing with basketball. I always tease with the kids when they want to talk about LeBron James or, you know, Kobe or, you know, even uh, you know, Steph, Curry, Steph Curry and um, you know, Harden. Uh, they all talk about him, and I keep using Michael Jordan. I mean, he's great. But let's face it, uh, he was controversial with teammates, how he was. But make no mistake about it, the guy was a gamer. He wanted to win. And he wanted everybody else around him to have that same mindset. And that's challenging at times. You know, some people can't accept that. But fortunately, uh, you know, he, he won. And there's a reason why. Because he was good at what he did. So, yeah, because you look at, you know, you look at the way they did the documentary series. And uh, back it in. Good. It was good. They did a great, really good job of it. Yeah. I mean, you know, back in 2014 when ESPN came out with the 30 for 30 uh, about the bad boys. And you saw the piston side on how they beat, you know. And their opinions about the Bulls. In this series, you saw the Chicago Bulls theories and their thoughts on getting over the hump in Detroit. And both sides can agree. Without the bad boys in the '80s, there would be no there would be no Michael Jordan and his dynasty. So that they they did that in a great way. They showcased um, you know Dennis Rodman's story, Steve Kerr's story, all all the key factors in a great way, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can tell I had to move for a second because somebody else needed my other room there for another reason. So I kind of moved out here or whatever. <laughs> but, the, yeah, you're right. I mean, the, the, the antagonist, the protagonist, there always has to be one in a story, uh, you know. And so even in sports, I mean, I'm, I'm one of those that's like when I play a game, um, I don't play to lose. Um, I have that same mindset. I don't uh, – as a type A personality, you kind of get uh, off put by people that are mediocre. They just kind of want to go with the flow or just there to kind of have fun. I'm thinking to myself, you know, I – I, long ago, I, we, when we were kids, we didn't have these uh, participation awards, I guess, if you will. I'm not a participation award type, type of guy. I coach Same. flag football, and I'm very intense, but I coach flag football. Uh, and we don't tend to lose when we play flag football. And I've had to warn parents ahead of time, listen, uh, we're here to play, and uh, we're not here to have juice boxes at halftime and uh, little cookie snacks in our, in our, our packets. We're here to play, and I'm, I want to teach them about winning. Uh, I don't yell and scream at the kids, uh, curse them out. But I have expectations, you know, even if they are just two years old. I'm just kidding. So, <laughs> I mean, that's not- six, seven, and eighth graders. I, I coach a flag football. I've been doing this for years. And uh, wow. I'm going to say it. Uh, we, we haven't lost a game in three years now. We haven't lost a game in three years. And we got that's a, that's a fact that we play four seasons a year. We play two indoors and two outdoors. And I'm a little upset because we've had to miss this. Uh, uh, our, our last two games of the indoor season, we were once again uh, without a loss. And then our spring season hasn't started yet uh, because of this pandemic. And I'm looking forward to it. So a lot of other coaches don't like me. Uh, sometimes the coaches don't get along with me too well. Uh, but uh, we like to win. So going back to Michael Jordan, I understand exactly his mindset. He, he wants to win. 
Yeah, makes you, uh, you know, any other coaches' eyes, you're probably furious, you're probably like a uh, Vince Lombardi or a Bill Belichick, always wanting to win and uh, just die, just want die, just want, you know, other coaches like, okay, we're we're just here, to, you know, to win and obviously have fun. You're just there. Let's just win. Let's just get. Let's just win these championships. Let's rack them up. Uh, uh, don't kid yourself. These other dads want to win too, but they go there with a the mindset of pretending like they're just here to have fun. They want to win. <laughs> so, okay. Antagonists. I get it. I can accept that. So I lose votes when I coach football. So I lose them. <laughs> so, and I'm okay with it. Oh well. Just first off, yeah. Congratulations with uh, your flag football news. Just hopefully when that comes back going around, we get to hear more great news about you and your winning mentalities. But um, transitioning from flag football to the NFL, specifically talking about the Lions. What did you think about the Lions' overall draft for this year? You know, I, I'll be honest with you guys. I haven't been able to pay as much attention to that in light of all this yeah. crisis going on. I've been dealing with more of the, uh, the CNN governor's report. So, honestly, the sports thing I had to set aside for a while. And uh, as unfortunate as that is, you know, I understand they have made some pretty good selections. And uh, even the challenges asked with people wanting to know about, uh, you know, uh, the coach and uh, his team. You know, it's the, you know, now they're – those that really need to leave, I think, have left. It, it, it's, it's Patricia's team, so they got to allow him the opportunity to kind of lead the team. And uh, you know, they haven't been doing too well. Uh, there's been questions there, but uh, as a coach, if you don't have people on board uh, understanding your mentality, it's going to create that divisiveness. And I think some of that is kind of lessened. I think now he's able to bring in some folks that he really, I think, is going to uh, be able to tune the team up and move in his direction. And let's give it a go. Let's see how he does with it. Yeah, let's. Yeah, we're hoping. Um, I mean, they they kind of shocked me when they took a running back in the second round that out of Georgia. That definitely shocked me. Um, the first round pick that was definitely uh, was. I was hoping they would trade out of that, but they ended up uh, taking the guy that was for they uh, were looking at uh, in all the mock drafts. So that was so totally predictable. Uh, so and one final question for you, Mark. I've asked you. I've been fortunate enough to ask you twice when you came in, um, and I'm going to ask you this again. Uh, you, you said before in, in the previous two shows that you were on, you did you ran for you ran for uh, sheriff of Macomb County. Okay, sorry about that. You thought, you know, the person in there it wasn't right. You ran for you ran for you ran for executive because you thought the position uh, you know, wasn't right. So so now asking again, is there still a plan to run for governor? In the uh, depending on how things, depending on how things, depending on how go, you know, just like just like we said, like I said previously, sheriff, you know, could that be a possibility for you if a person, you know, pet, if not do a great great job for the state, will inspire you to run from 2024. Yeah, we'll see. I, I'm, I'm never in a uh, hurry to look down the road that far. I mean, I enjoy what I do. Um, and again, I, I'm a kid who's born and raised here in Macomb County. Uh, so I think there's a lot of other you know, uh, interests or things that I want to try to figure out how do we accomplish here as a county. And uh, I would look at two aspects. In other words, what is it that I would be looking to do if I was the governor rather than just say, oh my God, I want to be the governor. And uh, the other is, what, uh, you know, who is it that would come in to replace you next? In other words, uh, what what personality do you think would be a, a good fit for the next county executive? You know, having been the first ever county executive elected here in Macomb County, uh, that was a unique challenge, and uh, we've kind of set the tone. Uh, the question is, you know, when you leave, uh, you, you can't help but always think about, you know, who's going to be that replacement, who's going to be the next person. I would never walk away from it and not care. I would always be concerned because you don't want to leave it in a situation where it's going to be more political. And or more partisan. I think that's the thing I valued most is we've been able to stay away from partisan politics and uh, you know set the tone moving forward. I would hope that whoever comes in next isn't going to have the strong. Let's build a Republican coalition here. Let's build a Democratic coalition as opposed to let's build a coalition for 870,000 people, voters, non-voters, Democrats, Republicans, uh, people of all walks of life. That's what I enjoy okay. most about being the first ever county executive. I hope the next person coming in has that same mindset. Yeah, I told, and yeah, I agree with you on that. And, um, and Mark, it's been an absolute honor to have you on our show for the third time, uh, an answering some really tough questions, uh, really, you know, questions about these uh, challenging times and uh, how we're, you know, how we're going to be open and just get just finish the job and get everything close, to getting everything back to a uh, new normal. So. 
been a pleasure, guys. I appreciate it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a little plug in here, whatever. You'll see the uh, thing on the bottom of your screen. If anybody needs any information about what's going on in Macomb County, COVID-related or not, go to macombgov.org. Uh, uh, operators are standing by for your for your, 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 your input uh, on the website there. So macombgov.org. Uh, we got an incredibly robust website for COVID-related issues as well as anything you need from county government. So please check this out. You heard them. You heard the man. Go to that website. Yeah. If you have any questions? All right. So, Mark, we again we appreciate your time with us. You're you're one of our favorite guests, and uh, hopefully we'll be talking to you sometime in the uh, in the future when everything is back to normal, so we can hear about uh, uh, your flag football team bringing home another championship. Yeah, you too, hey, and good luck to both of you guys moving forward with your education in your school too. All right. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Mark. We really appreciate all this. We appreciate all right, your time. Guys. Thank you. Stay healthy. Stay safe. You too. You too as well. So, not, what a great way to conclude a double feature uh, for this week. Uh, we usually dive, don't dive into politics, but with Bark, you know, we kind of wanted to ask, you know, these questions with this pandemic going around. We wanted we wanted to get some answers, and he gave he gave us some really good thought, really real, great answers, uh, input and answers. Yes, and you know, it was a great. This was a great way to conclude uh, a double header. Uh, if you haven't already, go watch the uh, Stefan Logan interview. That is a great interview to learn, uh, to find out about his time with Pittsburgh, the Detroit Lions, and his entire career breaking records in the CFL. Uh, so please and please make sure to go like and subscribe to all to our YouTube channel. Uh, click that little bell icon up, up at the top. And like Mark said, go to macomb.gov.org to find out uh, anything at your questions, COVID-related or not related, based on the county if you live in this county. Uh, and please make sure to follow us on all of our social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and check out our new website. It is a fantastic website. I highly recommend it. So, and apologies to Sam Martin. We ran out of time again. Uh, so, and please make sure to join us next week as we welcome former Michigan State Spartan and Carolina Panther and Cincinnati, Cincinnati Bengal quarterback Demetrius Cox. That's a must-watch interview for all of you next week. So, until then... Stay, stay home. Stay safe. Uh, social, you know, venture out if you venture out, like Mark said, if you need to. Uh, go get a haircut if you need it. Trust me, because I actually do. Uh, yeah, you too. Uh, so, so, anyway, until then, until we meet again, as always, keep it fresh.